Tonight we're going to be doing Revelation chapter 2, right at the end of your Bible. <coughs> Excuse me, Revelation 2. I'm going to be doing verses 1 and 2. Um, so, good to be joined by some new people uh, in our little Bible study tonight. Um, this is where we go a little bit deeper into the Bible and we kind of... Uh, occasionally look into the original language and everything so um, if it's a little bit deep tonight it's just kind of where we're at um, and I do encourage you to have a look at our YouTube channel and uh, the previous Bible studies that we've done on there and it'll make, probably make a bit more sense. So Revelation chapter 2 and verses 1 and 2 which I will read out to you. Unto the angel of the church of Ephesus write, These things saith he that holdeth the seven stars in his right hand, who walketh in the midst of the seven golden candlesticks. I know thy works, and thy labour, and thy patience, and how thou canst not bear them which are evil, and thou hast tried them which say they are apostles, and are not and has found them liars. Um, so, in verse 1 we have the name of the church that uh, the Lord Jesus is saying to John, write, write this letter to them. Um, this is a follow-on from a kind of vision, and as I say, if you have a look at last week's uh, Bible study, it will make more sense. But this is part of a vision that the Apostle John has uh, where Jesus appears to him uh, and starts to talk to him about, um, well, in this case, seven churches. And this is the first of those churches. And it's the church at Ephesus. And, of course, we have Paul's letter to the Ephesians. So that's the same church uh, that he's talking about. Um, Paul wrote uh, Ephesians, it, it's reckoned round about 60 AD, 60 AD. Uh, Revelation is written uh, about 30 years later. Um, but it's important to see that the Lord is addressing this primarily to, um, to the angel. He says, unto the angel of the church of Ephesus. Now, last week I made a case, which I think was fairly a fairly good case, for the fact that in when we think of angel, we think of like angelic being, you know, some kind of supernatural being. But here, that angel actually simply means the the minister of the church, the one who brings messages, because angel means messenger. That it's the minister, it's the pastor, it's the elder. Those terms are really kind of interchangeable because today when we talk... Um, when we talk about a bishop, for example, today, you think of someone in kind of robes and, you know, the Catholic Church or, Rome, or the, the Church of England. In those days, a bishop was just an elder, really. So I kind of don't want to get into the minutiae of what those terms mean. Suffice us to say it's talking about the leader of the church, whether you call him pastor or you call him elder or minister or whatever. Yeah. Uh, yeah. So... Um, so, yeah, that's what it's talking about. It's addressed to primarily one person. Because when you read this quite often, it's the message to the churches, but it's actually primarily talking to the minister. And, um, and this is where the older King James Version is actually more useful than the contemporary translations. There are advantages and disadvantages in using an old version like the King James Version, but here is one of the advantages, and that is it sometimes preserves the subtleties of the original Greek language. So the Greek language preserves the idea of whether whether it's speaking to one person or, or whether you're speaking to a group of people, and that's kind of lost in our contemporary English. So I'll give you an example of what I mean. So. If I was to say, if I was to look at Will and say, oh, I've got something that I want to tell you, then because I'm looking at him, you know that I, I, I'm just talking to him. But if I said the same words and I kind of looked around and said, 
oh, I've got something that I want to tell you, then I could be addressing everybody, right? But what we have in the, in the King James Version is that the words thou, thee, thy, and thine, and these, these aren't really words that we use anymore in English, but when I use those words, it indicates that I'm speaking to one person. It's singular, right? But when the King James uses ye, you, or your, it's addressing more than one person. So that's kind of useful. And uh, we can see an example of this and how, and how useful it is. If you turn to Luke 22, so the Gospel of Luke. I'll try not to go too fast. Um, Luke 22. So remember, um, so remember, you, yours, means a group of people, uh, thou, thee, thine, thy, is, is speaking to one person. So Luke 22, verse 31, and the Lord said, Simon, Simon, behold, Satan hath desired to have you, that he may sift you as wheat. So that's all of the disciples, right? For well, I have prayed for thee, that thy faith fail not. So you can see that he's saying, first of all, Satan has desired to sift all of you. But I've prayed for, was it thou? I've prayed for thee, Peter. I've prayed for you, Peter. So you can say, that's how you come in. You sit next to Miriam on that bed. Maybe you could say sit there. Uh, it's okay. Yeah, so you can see here it preserves the difference between uh, a group of people um, who Satan has has, uh, has sifted, but now he's saying, but I pray for you, Peter. Singular. Where is the Sorry, I'm not so, Yeah, it's Luke 22, verses 31 and 32. So I've just had a cat visitor. Let's get rid oh, of that cat. No. It's coming <laughs> with Rajiv. He wanted to be on the camera. Come here. He's just a bit of a pest, to be honest. Oh. <laughs> Are you cute? Oh. I could just have a little shot of him on the camera. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> 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 we turn into Mike Winger, showing him a cat every few five minutes. Okay, so um, so yeah, that's really useful uh, in the older English because you can see when it's talking about one person or when it's talking about um, a group of people and so when we get back to um, Revelation Revelation 2 which is where we are and it starts unto the angel of the church of Ephesus write these things saith he that holdeth the seven stars uh, and, and so on verse 2 I know thy works and thy labour and thy patience. So who is he talking about? Is he talking about everybody? Or is he just talking about the minister? It's singular, right? So he's actually talking to the pastor slash elder slash minister. When, he, when Jesus says, I know thy works and thy labour and thy patience and how thou canst not bear them which are evil. Now if you had that in a, in a modern translation, you might think he's talking to the entire church. So I just think it's useful uh, that that is preserved. And I would encourage people um, to use the King James Version. I think it's a good translation. Unless English is not your first language, in which case you're probably better off with a Bible in your own language. Or um, the better of the modern translations would be something like the New King James Version. Um, but I do think this is an interesting feature of of the King James, that it preserves that those nuances that are there in the Greek. Um, so he's addressing the pastor of the church. Uh, does that mean then that all the letters to the churches are only of interest to pastors or, or ministers? No, not at all. They're for all Christians. And what is what Jesus is saying is this is how your church should be led. You know, these are the things 
these are the things that you should do or have and these are the things that you should not do or not have so that's of interest to anybody uh, when you're looking to join yourself to a church you should be looking at the leader of the church and saying well is the leader of the church leading us in these things that Jesus commends because because tonight that's what we're looking at this you know the things that Jesus says these are good things to have in your church these are good things to do and so so whilst there are lots of different opinions as to what a church should be like and on what's a good thing to do in your church here we've got Jesus himself telling us these are good things you know you do this and that's 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 a good thing to do um, so the the list of commendations um, that we have here it starts off by commending the elder for his works his good works so that tells you that the leader of the church should be doing good works you know, they should be active. Um, quite, quite often, you know, you hear um, evangelical Christians, Protestants, saying, "Well, it's not about works. It's about it's about grace. It's about faith in Christ. It's not actually about works." But here, every single letter that Jesus writes to the churches starts off, "I know thy works." So it is important to Jesus what works we do, and particularly what works the leader of the church is doing. And it goes on to say that Christian pastors should be labouring. He says, I know thy works and thy, uh, and thy labour. So I like the word labour because when you think of labourers, now I've done a bit of labouring my time, you think of labourers, they work hard. You know, they work hard, they sweat, they tend to not really get much uh, you know, people don't really notice labourers. You know, if someone labours to build a, a huge building, everyone remembers the architect or they remember, you know, who, who bought the building, but they don't remember the guys who were handling the bricks and the cement and were, you know, working in the rain and the cold and the hot sun. And um, But there you are. You wouldn't have the building if it hadn't been for the labourers. And so I like the word labourer here. You know, um, it's saying a pastor should labour. They should, they should work not to be praised or to be noticed, but just because there needs to be work done here. And what, and what is that work? Well, First Timothy five seventeen says, "Let the elders that rule well, sorry, that the elders that rule well be counted worthy of double honour, especially they who labour." In the word and doctrine so that's the labor that, that the leader of your church should be doing they should be laboring in the word they should be putting in the time and the effort to produce something you know not just like a little kind of sermonette with uh, you know oh, I had a nice thought you know not just a nice thought but something that's got a bit of you know substance to it something that's that that's Full of sound doctrine that's that's going to that's going to feed people that's going to tell them something about the Bible and how it all fits together so so that's the kind of laboring the kind of work um, that should be should be done again let's have a look at Acts chapter 6 chapter 6 so while you're just getting there I'll give you a little bit of background so this is in the days the early days of the church um, of the New Testament church and um, what was going on was they would feed uh, the widows at this time and the widows were um, you know it wasn't like today where you have like social security and benefits so they, because the widows didn't have a husband to take care of them, the church would take care of them and they would give them food uh, and make sure they were okay. But what was happening was that um, the, the, the church was, was made up of Gentiles and, uh, and Jews. And, and what was happening was the, um, uh, the, the, the Greek widows were being neglected 
uh, and, and the Hebrew widows were, were receiving food. And so there arose this kind of complaint saying, hang on, you know, the, the, these widows are getting food and these widows aren't. And so the church decides to do something about it. And, and Acts two, uh, 6 verse 2 says, Then the twelve called the multitude of the disciples unto them and said, It's not reason that we should leave the word of God to serve tables. Wherefore, brethren, look ye out among you seven men of honest report, full of the Holy Ghost and wisdom, whom we may appoint over this business. So he's saying, right, let's, let's sort out uh, seven men uh, who, are, who are honest, who are full of the Holy Spirit, and we can give them the responsibility for this. Why? Because, he says in verse 4, we will give ourselves continually to prayer and to the ministry of the word. So that is the job of the leader of the church. It's to give himself to prayer and to the ministry of the word and to delegate to other people uh, the more kind of um, practical um, issues of the church. Um, and, so, and so this is something that, that the leader of the church of Ephesus is being commended for. Um, He's also commended for his patience. Um, the leader of a church quite often has to show patience. Patience with other people, how they're progressing. Uh, patience just in general, you know, waiting, for, uh, waiting upon God and so on. I've got to be honest with you, this is something that I am not naturally given to. I'm not naturally... A patient person and I do struggle with it um, I think the reason is because I'm actually quite hard on myself I hate giving myself myself excuses uh, for not doing things and sometimes that means that I'm a bit harder uh, than I should be on others so pray for me you know I need prayer in this area uh, that I will be learn to be more um, patient and of course one of the ways in which God teaches his patience as we've been looking at on Sundays is by allowing you to go through a time of tribulation where you have no choice but to be patient and wait for God and wait and wait for it to be resolved and so on so um, so another reason why the leader of the church should be patient is to set an example to others quite often it's the leader of the church who is, if you like, the kind of the public face of the church who kind of sets the tone, sets the spirit of of what the church is going to be um, pursuing. And, do, you know, he, he kind of leads in the direction the church is going to be going. So it's important that the leader uh, embraces the things that Jesus thinks are important, isn't it? he's going to be directing the church and saying right we need to do this and we need to do that then it's really important that the things that that leader is saying this is really important are actually the same things that Jesus is saying this is really important um, so so we have this this need for uh, a diligence towards Bible study uh, towards patience towards faithfulness in prayer but I do think there's a balance here as well, because whilst I said, you know, it's important that leaders are patient. The Lord Jesus also says here that one of the th reasons he commends the minister is because he cannot bear them that are evil. So, so patience doesn't mean bearing with them that are evil. It can't, you know, otherwise Jesus would be commanding him for not bearing with them. Uh, so, so put it like this. Whilst our Sunday meeting is a public meeting, um, actually, it doesn't mean that just anyone can come. Sometimes there's that confusion. Well, it's a public meeting, so that means anyone can come. No, it means that if your intentions for coming are evil, and actually some people's are, then you may well be asked to leave. Uh, so let's have a look at it. And Jude, um, Jude actually uh, talks about this. Jude's only a short book, 
just just before Revelation there. And um, Jude, and just one chapter, of course, verse 4. Just give me a chance to get there. So Jude, Jude 1, verse 4. It says this, For there are certain men, there are certain men crept in, unawares this means crept into the church certain men crept in unawares who were before of old ordained to this condemnation ungodly men turning the grace of our god into lasciviousness and denying the only lord god and our lord jesus christ so he's saying there are people who will come into the church who are evil men when it goes on to ex expand the thought on that in Jude but it's saying you know you need to not be not be naive you know don't 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 just kind of think everyone who comes is 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 a lovely person and you know you have to be careful uh, that you 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 watch people who are who are coming in um, so actually it is both a pastor's biblical privilege and actually their legal right to remove someone from the meeting who is indulging in wickedness uh, or, depending on the situation, possibly to discipline um, the person uh, if they are becoming a stumbling block to others. So, for example, if someone shows up at church and they're drunk or, or they show up and they're, they're under the influence of drugs, or, or maybe, or if they show up and they're being threatening, or they're disrupting um, the meeting, then they will be asked to leave. And I have done it, I've had to do it. I don't like doing it, but I will do it. Uh, because ultimately, that meeting, particularly on a Sunday morning where it's just open to anybody, has to be a safe place. You know, everybody in the congregation has to be, has to feel like they're safe and um and and that's the responsibility well it's the responsibility of all of us but particularly you know a, a, a pastor is a shepherd and therefore he has a responsibility to his flock to keep them safe um he also actually has a legal responsibility as as evil actions can not only be a sin issue but can be a safeguarding issue. So actually there is a legal responsibility if you're running um, an event or a meeting and it's in your name, then the law expects you to take, you know, whatever steps are necessary to make that safe for the general public. So so these are things sometimes overlooked in churches, you know. It's, it's sort of like, oh, well, you know, you should let anybody come and... And, it, and if you say to somebody you can't come in, you're not, you're not really being a good Christian, you know, you're not really showing grace. But actually there are not just biblical responsibilities, but there are legal responsibilities that we have to have to uphold. I mean, I think it's entirely biblical, you know, I, I really do, uh, to keep people safe when they're in a meeting, as, mu as much as you can do. Um, so, uh, it also means that... Um, It also means that not only are you keeping people safe from from possibly disruptive uh, persons or, or violent persons, but actually you're keeping the congregation safe from false teaching. And this is what it said, wasn't it? Uh, or what the Lord Jesus said. He said, thou hast tried them, or you've tested them, which say they are apostles and are not and has found them liars. So what was happening in the in the early church was people were coming along and saying, oh, well, we're apostles, you know, we've got authority. We can teach the Bible. And, the, you know, some of them were apostles, but there were also false apostles who were going around and teaching people things that were not in the Bible, that were not what Jesus taught, and were not what Peter was teaching or what Paul was teaching. And this leader, this... Um, congregation the, the church at Ephesus is being commended because he's actually testing people who say they are apostles 
And if he finds them to be false, then Jesus is saying, yeah, you've shown them that they're liars. Um, so, so let's have a look at this, uh, this in action. Uh, first John, that is John's first epistle. We're not too far from there here. First John chapter four. We do a Bible study through First John um, via Facebook Live. So if you're on Facebook, you can always check that out. We do it. Um, I think it's every third Saturday now. Um, usually gets announced at church where we just go verse by verse by verse all the way through. We're going through First John at the moment. So 1 John chapter 4, verse 1. Beloved, believe not every spirit, but try the spirits, whether they are of God, because many false prophets are gone out into the world. So, yeah, you've got to, you've got to test, because when someone speaks... And preaches and teaches from the Bible it's the Holy Spirit speaking through them you know teaching the Word of God and and, and that's what we're looking for in a good teacher somebody who you know the Spirit of God is speaking through them but some people it's not the Spirit of God is speaking through them it's an unclean spirit uh, and it's saying look, you've got to watch out for that and you've got to test these spirits how do you test a spirit it's the word of God. It's like, is this person saying the same thing that Jesus says? Is this person saying the same thing that my Bible is saying? Or are they saying something completely different? In which case then, you know, it may be that they're a false apostle or a false prophet, as it's called in there. Um, so that's important that we have um, uh, that, kind of, that kind of correction. Uh, so this means that the minister... Or the leader of the church must be able to use the word of God for correction. It also means that uh, the pastor is expected to lead the church into sound doctrine. Again, I'll just, I won't we don't have to go to this, I'll just quote it. Titus 1 verse 9 says that a leader should hold fast to the faithful word as he hath been taught, that he may be able by sound doctrine, both to exhort and to convince the gainsayers. So gainsayers, somebody who's saying against, mm. right? And it's saying that your pastor, your leader, should have sufficient knowledge of the Bible that if someone comes along and starts teaching this, this false doctrine or teaching with this spirit that is not the spirit of God, should, he should be able to pick this up and say that's wrong and this is why so that so that's what you're looking for in leadership really is the ability to take the word of god and to and to convince or the word actually convince i think it actually means to convict so actually to convict the person that, that they're wrong and so that involves the leader again setting time aside to study the word to labor in the word until they're really, really familiar with it, till they really understand it. Um, and so, for that, the person has to be a mature Christian. Because, you know, if, you, if you've got to spend a lot of time studying the Word of God and, and reading and rereading the Bible and then, and then sort of really delving into it, that's not going to happen quickly, is it? It's going to happen over a period of time. So, ideally, the person should be a mature uh, Christian, I say ideally because quite actually in the early church, um, churches formed quite really quite fast. You know, there was three thousand people saved in one day, and the appointed elders. So that would have happened quite quickly. But now, uh, where we're at today, there is time where people can uh, mature as Christians. In fact, First uh, Timothy three six says that a leader in the church should be. Quote, not a novice, you know, not a new Christian, lest being lifted up with pride, he fall into the condemnation of the devil. So it's saying if you get like a young person who's 
and, and, and usually a young convert is a young person. You know, uh, uh, young people generally aren't people who've been Christians a long time, right? They're, they're usually recent converts. So if you get a young person and you put them in a position of leadership, it's saying that's a problem because they're not mature enough to handle that responsibility and they can end up falling into pride. You know, that, that's something a lot of young men struggle with, is pride. And therefore, it's saying they'll fall into the same condemnation as the devil, because that was the devil's sin. His pride, he lifted himself up, he thought he was better, uh, even than God, you know. So that's important because it protects the congregation from getting bad teaching, from a young convert but it also protects the young convert it means that they're not launched into some kind of you know position in the church that they weren't ready for uh, you know it can be disastrous not just for a congregation but for the young person as well so just to kind of finish off now really and, and kind of recap what we've done tonight Jesus commends leaders who are hard workers Labourers in the word, uh, who will not tolerate evil in the church, and who will test people who say they are teachers or preachers, uh, or at least those who desire to be teachers in the church. And if they are false teachers, that is, if their doctrine is is unsound, then he should have no problem with rejecting them, saying no, sorry, you know. I mean, it could be the case, like somebody says, oh. You know, I really feel like God's calling me to teach. In which case, that's great. But look, let's spend this next year then working with the pastor, and he'll, you know, he'll disciple you, and he'll teach, and he'll show you how to teach. And you know, you know, it could be that the person really does have a gift for teaching. But <clears throat> this is this is something that's so important in churches: is this discipleship, this idea of okay you know, uh, uh, or, or mentoring, it's sometimes called, where you join yourself maybe to an older guy who'll show you, you know, he'll, he'll tell you everything he knows and, 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 and bring you on. I really benefited from that, you know, from, from being willing. If you want to teach and you want to have authority in the church, then first of all, you need to be willing to learn, you know, to be a student, as it were, a Bible student. And, uh, you know, you need to be willing to, to humble yourself. They're the kind of people you want uh, leading churches, is, is people who, are, who have humility. Um, so this is the kind of pastor that is approved by Jesus. And so whatever church that you go to, that is the kind of leader you want. One who will um, work hard, um, will labour in the word, uh, won't tolerate evil. And, and we'll test teachers to see if they're teaching sound doctrine or false doctrine.